Well, good evening. Good evening. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 is where we'll be beginning this evening. Ending up our study of chapter 9, 10, and 11, that one sectional uh, piece that is actually like an island all of its own um, in the book of Romans. Uh, Romans 11 and verse 25 reads, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them. When shall I take away their sins? As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded, uh, concluded them all in the unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. We pause there and let's open up our hearts in prayer to the Lord, confessing all known sin before the Father, and then asking that the Lord might teach and direct uh, you as we study these words together. This is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, how great it is to open up your word and to find understanding. Thank you, Father, for teaching us and directing our thoughts. That, Father, we might be uh, stayed upon thee and might hear your word. Father, I know you have something very special to speak to each one of these men. And I pray, Father, that your spirit might minister to each one according to the need of the moment. Father, we love you so much and give you praise for your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We've been looking at chapter 9, 10, and 11, which is God's righteousness revealed by his sovereign choice. We've come as far as God's sovereign choice being fulfilled, and then it's being fulfilled in, in different manners. It was fulfilled in the election of grace. Um, second, it was fulfilled in the Gentiles, as we saw last time. And this time, it's fulfilled in Israel's salvation. And then finally, it's fulfilled in, to God's glory and praise. Verse 25, let me remind you, says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so also Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Israel's spiritual stumbling, he reminds us, is a temporary situation. It's not permanent. It's referred to um, in the Bible and in this passage as a mystery. Mystery. Um, the Greek word there, mysterion. Um, it comes from the Greek 
word mu'o, mu'o, which means to shut one's mouth, to remain silent. So mu'o is silent. To be still. And that gives us this word, mysterion. Now, obviously, every time I see a U, I get involved with it and make it into a Y. Because usually, if you make it into a Y, you'll see the English word that comes from that, that Greek cognate. Um, coming, uh, coming from the word silent, mysterion. Uh, by the way, um, this word, muo. Um, brought straight over into our language, into our English language, as the word mute. A person who is silent. A person who that doesn't speak is a mute. Uh, but also the word mystery comes from that. In scripture, a mystery is not a truth beyond understanding. Usually we use the word mystery that way, don't we? You'll say, oh, I looked at this and looked at that. It's still a mystery to me. Mystery meaning, it's unknown. I don't know how to how to process that. Um, it's not a truth that's beyond understanding. But in scripture, it's a truth previously unknown or previously unspoken, which has now been revealed and publicly proclaimed. It's a, a secret hidden by God in the past which he's now made known. Paul wanted to make sure that his Gentile readers, you and I, knew about the mystery concerning Israel in God's sovereign choice. God's purpose was so that you may not be conceited. Literally in the Greek language, it is wise in yourselves. You, you look and say, hmm, I'm pretty sharp at this. It's, that's being conceited, isn't it? Thinking you're wise in yourself. His purpose to reveal this mystery was so that we wouldn't feel wise in ourselves and say, hey, hey, I'm pretty sharp. I caught on to what this gospel thing is, and I worked it out, and I realized I was a sinner, and I realized I needed a savior, and I, I looked at all the angles, and this is what I've done. It isn't by your wisdom by your thinking that you are saved. It is by God's grace. And he revealed this mysterion. He revealed this mystery of what is happening to Israel. Right now, there is a dullness, there is a blindness that has come upon the nation of Israel. And in that period of time, we refer to that period of time as the age of grace. Or, what else? The church age. You'll hear pastor use these terms in reference to from the time of, of uh, uh, Christ's coming, and death and such, that, that started the church age all the way through the book of Acts, through your life and mine, and on to the point of the rapture of the saints when he gathers us home. That is the age of grace of the church age. <coughs> And what's unique about this is that Israel is not front and center. That God is not dealing with his people Israel to get the gospel out. They had kind of a rough go of that. Um, that's what they were supposed to be doing in the Old Testament, but oftentimes they just kind of kept it in-house uh, amongst themselves. This mystery um, is God's sovereign plan to put Israel aside temporarily. I'm really cautious what words I use here so that there's not a mistake in your thinking about what is Israel. Can, can Jewish people be saved? Mm -hmm. Amen. If they can be saved like you and I. They have to overcome, the Bible uses the word stumbling blocks. They have to overcome some things that you and I don't have to overcome in coming to the church, but they they do have some, they are able to trust in Christ. Keep that in mind. So I'm cautious how I put this. 
But God's sovereign plan is to put Israel aside temporarily in order to show grace to the Gentiles, you and I, in a manner that no basis for conceit or pride on the part of the Gentiles. It's designed to display the universal scope of the glory of God. During this age of grace, during this church age that we live in right now, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going out to all the nations of the world. Ethnos, the nations of uh, other groups, uh, uh, linguistic groups, uh, um, national groups and such, going out to all, including to Israelites who live here in the United States, in Borough Park, Brooklyn, or live in Israel, or live in Paris, France. Throughout the world, there are those of the tribe of Israel. And the gospel is going to them as well. But it primarily, during this age of grace, is going out through the agency of Gentile believers. Do you see that? Even when we talk about Jewish evangelism, usually we're talking about individual Gentile believers who are actively involved in trying to get the gospel understandable to the Jewish people of our own day. God purposed that some from every nation should by faith receive the righteousness provided by grace. In order to achieve this goal, Israel's unique relationship with God was set aside, may I say, set aside for a season. And Israel is now experiencing what is referred to here in this text as a partial hardening until the full number, pleroma in the Greek language, um, translating fullness, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God is now taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. Get this. Christ is waiting. There's coming a day in which that very last Gentile in the church age will receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The angels will rejoice. And you and I will hear the trumpet sound and will be gathered up. It will be the rapture. We'll be gathered up to be with him forevermore will vanish which will start that seven years of tribulation that seven years of tribulation is primarily a time of judgment upon God's people and upon unbelieving Gentiles um, the, gen the time of the Gentiles the fullness has come in God is now taking from the Gentiles a people for himself as it says in Acts chapter uh, 15 and verse 14. Why don't you just glance over there at that text. That is primary for our understanding of, of these verses we're looking at today. In Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, those of you that went through the study of Acts with me are familiar with this passage, or you on your own reading and such are familiar with this passage <coughs> of the uh, Council of Jerusalem when they taught Gentiles were trusting in Christ. What do you do with them? Do you circumcise them and put a yarmulke on their head? What, what do you do with these guys? Or did they all of a sudden just become Jews to become a part of the church of Jesus Christ? Acts chapter 15 verse 1 deals with that. The people came together to Jerusalem for that purpose. Verse 1 said, and a certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. He's talking about the city of Antioch at this time. And when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. I want you to stop for a moment. Christians don't fuss with one another. Amen? The church is a place of peace. We never hear any... Um, ill-spoken word in the church of Jesus Christ, right? Here's the church of Jesus Christ in Antioch in the first century, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. Soon as they had a real fire going 
in their discussions with others. And people's feelings were very hurt and, and people's attitudes towards one another was getting insulting. And outside of the framework of what we would expect to happen in a church, they had no small dissension. And if you didn't catch that enough, disputation. What's a disputation? That's a carefully run argument, isn't it? That's a fussing in another guy's face. Debate. With them. Debate. That's <laughs> nice. There's well, order to debates. But this is a disputation. This is a fussing with one another. With them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem into the apostle, uh, unto the apostles and the elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Dissent, dispute, joy. One message can cause that much of a difference. You see that? And it says, um, verse 4, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose up, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. What he's trying to get across there is that these were indeed believers in Jesus Christ, but they were from the sect of Pharisees. Do you know anybody like that? Paul was. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was of the Pharisees. And these people, believers in Jesus Christ, they're emphasizing that. Certain of the sect of Pharisees, which believed. They were true believers. They said, you need to circumcise them. If they're going to be here amongst God's people, Israel, then they need to be circumcised. And the apostles and the elders came together for they considered this matter. And when there had been much, oh no, disputing, Peter rose up and said, man and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving to them, these Gentile believers, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, both Jew and Gentile, I might add, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring the miracles, the wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. They gave a missionary report. And after they had held their peace, James answered and said, Men, brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, Peter, hath declared how God at the the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I'll return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I'll build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon him. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God, are all his works from beginning to the world. Um, this dispute comes up over the subject, understandably, that Gentiles are coming to know Christ. And now Paul, he was there, is now here writing to the Roman believers in Jesus Christ, and he urges them. He said, I don't want you ignorant, brothers, that about this mystery 
this that has been revealed, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. There's coming a day of the plenoma is the word that's used here. The fullness of the Gentiles. What I was talking about when I said when that last Gentile comes to know Jesus the Savior, you'll hear the trump announce that one and you and I will be gathered up to the Lord at the rapture. Um, I don't want by your own conceit that the blindness in part has happened to Israel. The word blindness in verse 25 in the King James Version or the word hardening in your modern translations if you're looking on a different <coughs> translation blindness or hardening is the word porosis porosis that's a troubling word porosis porosis it's troubling because we know a Latin word that is really 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 close to that and so it it takes us off running in Latin when this is a Greek word and the Latin osteoporosis per, you have pores in your skins what are they holes porosis uh, is the, the Latin word for holes so, so holes in your bones osteoporosis okay and and we go running in the wrong direction uh, with this whereas to the Greek, the word porosis is used in reference to a tree that falls into a slime and soon you got you a rock and so it would be the word petrified <coughs> petrified Peter on this rock I will build my church. you know these words okay you know a whole lot more more Greek than you'll admit to Petrified is just simply um, made into a stone. Um, translated in the modern translations here in this text as hardening. But in actuality, uh, hardening takes you off running in the wrong direction. Because it, it's a hardening, yeah. Petrification, yeah. If you're talking about things. But if you're talking about people, and how they behave with one another, it would be best, porosis would be best referred to as stupidity. Stupidity, dullness. You understand when I say that that man is very, very dull. He works these things through, but um, he, he has a different, um, petrified, yes, a hardening. If it's skin, it's, calcified okay or uh, not calcified but calloused you get calloused in or petrified wood but men you got stupid men you've got dull men can't think very clearly okay now look at that where it says that a dullness a stupidity in part has happened to the nation Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is come in, until that last Gentile trusts in the Lord. It differs from our common word harden, um, which was used of Pharaoh in chapter 9 and verse 18. We refer to the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. Um, that's a different word. That is uh, skleros. Scleros, the root of that word, scleros, uh, to be to be made hard, okay, hardened. Pharaoh's um, hardened his heart. Then Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then finally we get to the point. God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and again. Another, the next verse, uh, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. That's, that's the word skleros. 
on the side, just for those of you that love linguistics and stuff. That's it's from the, the word that gives us our word, skeleton. It's that hard part of your body, <laughs> okay? It gives us the word skeleton for the hardened, hardened part. Um, also, we would translate this, hardened is stubborn. A stubborn, stubborn heart, uh, and that uh -huh, goes with scleros, okay? But that's not the word that's being used here. Boros, which is a dullness, a stupidity that's come upon the nation of Israel uh, at this particular period of time. Um, yeah. Why did the King James use the word blindness? Okay, they can see this and they translate the word boros uh, correctly in other places. Uh, why would they translate it as blindness? Well, because blindness was already in the text. Um, when you look up in, in the verses previous to that, the, the word blindness, the, the not being able to see, uh, comes in. And so they just, I guess they thought it would be worth um, emphasizing that. But um, borosis refers to a dullness as opposed to the stubbornness as the word hardness. And hardness, you need an explanation there. Here are given two specific facts about Israel's, I use the word dullness, or lack of sensitivity to the gospel. First, it's partial. He says, in the, a blindness in part, a dullness in part has happened to Israel. It's, it isn't complete. There are believers among the nation of Israel, and many come to know the Lord. There's, there's whole synagogue groups that are meeting now in these days um, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus as their Messiah. And so it's just a blindness in part. It's a a dullness in part has happened to the nation of Israel. It's partial. Because through this time, there's a remnant. There is a remnant that is chosen by grace. Look back up at verse 5. I just remind you of what we studied already. Verse 5 says, Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So it's a remnant of believers among the nation of Israel. So it's partial. And second, it's temporary because it will end when God's sovereignly chosen number of Gentiles has been um, been saved. A, a, a dullness in part has happened to Israel until, the moment he puts that until, there's a time in for that. There is a time in which this dullness will come to a screeching halt. Look at verse 26. And so, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Reference to, to the Jews. Verse 27. For this is my covenant, says God, unto them, when I, God, shall take away their Israel's sins. After the fullness of the Gentiles, the partial dullness of Israel will be removed and all Israel will be saved. That is, they will be delivered from the terrible tribulation by the Messiah, the deliverer who will come. In the Old Testament terminology, the word saved is often equivalent of the word delivered. And you've seen that a lot in your own Old Testament study. Um, very similar. They're equivalent. To confirm this, Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 20 through 21 and 27 and 9. Let's look back there. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Familiar passage. Isaiah 59, verse 20. Isaiah 
59 and verse 20. This is what um, Paul is quoting, okay, when he when he gives us uh, verse 26. In Isaiah 59, verse 20, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, Israel, saith the Lord. You do remember Jacob's name was changed to Israel. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith Jehovah the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of the seed, nor out of the mouth of the seed's seed, saith Jehovah the Lord, from henceforth and forever. That's what he's quoting in verse 26 when he says, So all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion deliver that shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And then you're almost right there, said Isaiah 27 and verse 9. Isaiah 27 and verse 9. In Isaiah 27 and verse 9, the prophet writes, by this, therefore, shall the iniquity, the sin of Jacob, Israel, be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in asunder, and the groves and the images shall not stand up. The statement, all Israel will be saved, doesn't mean that every last Jew living at the time of Christ's second coming will be born again, regenerated. Many of them will not be saved, as is seen in the fact that the judgment of Israel to follow soon after the Lord's return will include the removal of Jewish, and the word is rebels. Ezekiel chapter 20, glance over at Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 34. Ezekiel 20 and verse 34, where this is prophesied. In Ezekiel 20 and verse 34, we read, And I will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered, with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will plead with you, saith the Lord God, and I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will, don't miss it, purge out from amongst you, there's the word, the rebels, and them that transgress sin against me, and I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn. They shall not enter into the land of Israel, for the millennial kingdom, and ye shall know that I am Jehovah. God's telling them, Yes, when he comes back a second time, when he returns, and the time of the Gentiles is complete, when the age of grace is finished, when the church age has come to its last person, one to Christ, he will then turn to Israel, but there will be those among them who will rebel. He will come to bring his messianic kingdom, the thousand-year reign um, that we studied in our study at the book of of, of uh, Revelation. He will come to set up that reign, and yet there will be those that will raise arm against him when he attempts to do that. Following this judgment of God, then remove ungodliness uh, and sin from the nation, he establishes his new covenant with regenerated <coughs> Israel. A familiar passage is Jeremiah 31 and 33. Jeremiah Jeremiah 
31. And verse 33. And we read there. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin. We studied that and we looked at that when we were looking at the book of, of Revelation, that the coming of the Messianic kingdom, he will call those people by heart, they will receive him as Lord. In verse 28, verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Here Paul summarized God's dealing with Israel and with the Gentiles um, in order for God to bring the gospel to those Gentiles he had to deal with the people of Israel in a way that looks like he's his, their enemy. But the nation crumbled. Roman troops marched across. They were sold in slavery in Egypt and then off into other parts of Europe, being treated roughly ill. No nation in Palestine, no nation of Israel. What a horrid thing that was for the Jewish people whose whole mind was Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Their mind is on that one place and they can't even go there. There are enemies that are controlling that. And it seemed like God himself was their enemy until some of you can remember, if you're old enough to remember when Israel became a state, declared itself. You remember what a glorious time that was? The moment they declared themselves as a state, at least if you know history, you know what happened. All the nations around them attacked. And then you probably remember in 56 when a similar thing occurred, all the nations around them attack. And then of course, the Yom Kippur War. Uh, would you like to go out on a date? Says the man to, to the girl. And the girl says, you crazy? Don't you know there's a war going on? He said, oh, that's right. How about next week? <laughs> lots, of, lots of jokes of that Yom Kippur War when, when Israel within seven days was able to subdue every nation surrounding them and very much alone. We didn't sell, we didn't send 80 some billion dollars in equipment to that nation of Israel during that period of time. No, they alone, it seemed like everyone, it seemed like God was their enemy. And that's what he's trying to express in, in this passage before us. That it seemed as if God was their enemy. In order for God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, he had to put Israel in this awkward position for thousands of years. But in relation to God's choice, his election of Abraham and his covenant with him and the patriarchs, Israel remains beloved because God chose Abraham. He chose Isaac. He chose Jacob. He loves the nation and will carry through on his promises and he will never retract the promises that he made to the patriarchs. He'll never retract the promises he made to King David. Hmm. This is another reason why Israel's hardening, dulling must be temporary that they must finally be saved as a people. God chose Israel. God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable, it says. Literally, for not repented are the grace gifts and the calling of 
God is what's said there in the Greek. He does not revoke what he has given or whom he has chosen. The calling means election and salvation. Remember that in, in uh, our study of chapter 1 and verse 6. Romans chapter 1 and verse 6 where we read Romans 1 6 among whom are ye also the called Jesus Christ in chapter 8 and verse uh, 30 not that long ago we studied chapter 8 and verse 30 moreover whom he did predestinate then he also called and to whom he called then he also justified saved and whom he justified then he also glorified so when he looks at you he looks at you in his presence in glory in all um, of his glory numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 god is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent change his mind hath he said and shall he not do it or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good numbers 23 verse 19 that's one worth committing to memory god's gifts to israel and god's calling of israel cannot be taken back or changed or god would cease to be true to his own word the fact that israel may not enjoy her gifts or live up to her privileges as the elect nation doesn't modify this fact a single bit god will be consistent with himself god will be true to his word his promises no matter what men may do romans 3 verse 3 literally translated says shall their unbelief make the faithfulness of god without effect hardly and then verse 30 for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy, Gentiles, through your mercy, they, the Jews, also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them in all unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. The Romans, to whom Paul wrote, were at a time disobedient to God prior to their trusting in Christ as Lord, right? But in this age of grace, non-Jews, that's the ye in here that he's talking about, the non-Jews have now received mercy. When Adam disobeyed, all of mankind was constituted as sinners because all Humanity in Adam sinned. Chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 12. You remember when we looked at this in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, us, for that all have sinned drop down to verse 19 for as by one man's disobedience speaking of Adam many were made sinners so by the obedience of one that's Jesus Christ shall many be made righteous what a powerful Israel they is now disobedient to God so that when God's mercy to the Gentiles you and I reaches its full number Israel will again receive full mercy God's ultimate purpose is to have mercy on all his children to do so justly God has bound all men over to disobedience look at how that's put in verse 32 if you have a modern translation, you'll be puzzled as to why I'm having difficulty with verse 32. But it says, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he 
might have mercy upon all. Um, that word concluded in the King James Version in verse 32. That word that's translated concluded is the word, and I'll just use the Y right away, sin ek, nie, sin. Um, and sin ekliese means to enclose, but it's a cool word. It means to enclose, not I'm walking this way, and a gate comes up in front of me. That's not this word. This is, I'm walking this way, and a gate comes up, and I turn to the right, and it's there too, and I turn to the left, and all around, I'm completely, completely surrounded. And that's what um, sin ecclesum um, is translated, to enclose or to shut in on every side. Vincent, the Greek scholar, explains the use of this word concluded, which is used here in the King James. It's a little odd. We wouldn't probably use that. But in 1611, um, he says this, a very literal rendering, etymologically considered con, C-O-N, as together, and cladere, to shut. Con clandere. The King James Version followed the Latin Vulgate, conclusit. Um, the word concluded comes directly from that, obviously has lost the sense of being shut up. This is concluded. It doesn't mean it's, to us it just means that's the end. That's the, you don't go any further. Um, uh, concluded back in 1611 means to be surrounded and to be um, hemmed in on all sides. Um, the word concluded obviously has lost that sense of being, said Vincent, of being shut up. The Greek scholar Wiest very aptly used the word corral in his translation. Um, Translation. What you wished I had. Um, he uses the word corralled um, and said, and then declares Webster re defines corralled as being confined in, to enclose, to coop up. The thought is that God confined both Jew and Gentile within the scope of one kind of uh, one kind of guilt and that guilt that affects both Jew and Gentile is unbelief and that is this synecleism that that has corralled us in on all sides uh, the new american standard translates this for god has shut up in all disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. If you've got the NIV in front of you, the New International Version, it says, for God has bound all men over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. Um, the Holman Christian Study Bible says, for God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may have mercy on all. You know the meaning of the word now. It's being, it's being corralled. It's being um, hemmed in on every single side. So just simply being shut up or, or bound or in prison um, kind of misses it a little bit. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Jews and the Gentiles alike, says Romans 3.9, are all under sin, that there is, chapter 3, verse 22,
no difference between Jew and Gentile. On this point, we're each facing unbelief and only through faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is their freedom from that situation. When the Gentiles rejected God and they disobeyed him, <coughs> God chose Abraham and his descendants as his very special people. Now the disobedience of Israel enabled God to show mercy to all the world. That was his intent. Then when that pur purpose is achieved, when all mankind can hear, then he will again show mercy again to the nation of Israel. That's what Paul is trying to express here. And then we see not only God's sovereign choice fulfilled in Israel's salvation, but also God's sovereign choice fulfilled to God's glory, to God's praise. Look at that verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, God, and through him, him alone, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. But when you're reading this in the original, it just stands out all of a sudden. <laughs> You're talking about the Jews and the Gentiles and salvation to both both Jew and Gentile. It's exciting as you're reading it. Yes, and you can see, oh, the rapture's coming really soon. And then will that judgment come upon the nation Israel? Those horrid seven years. But then at the conclusion of that, Christ will return and set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, in Israel. And his people will be a unique people, special in that particular period of time. Yes, both Jew and Gentile believers, but the believers who are of Jewish background, they will be in a unique position during that 1,000 year reign. You're seeing this and you're, and you're understanding this and then all of a sudden, it's like he switches gears and he starts singing. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments his ways are past finding out. When Paul ended his discussion on God's righteousness revealed in the sovereign choice, he breaks forth into doxology. One of my, uh, one of my books, theolo uh, theologian said, theology always ends in doxology. That when you begin looking at God and Focusing wholly upon him, that soon, like Paul, just kick out of the normal conversation and start praising God for who he is. He is worthy of our praise. He says, oh, the depth, he says, oh, the um, depth of the riches of the wisdom, the depth of the rich, uh, riches of his knowledge of God. The plan of God for the salvation of all people demonstrates God's infinite knowledge and his ability to use it wisely. God has revealed some of his judgment and his paths, his ways, so that the people may know him. But it's humanly impossible to exhaust it. The phrase, past finding out. Did you do you remember that? And the depth of the riches, both the wisdom and the knowledge uh, of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. And don't miss this phrase, the end of verse 33. His ways past finding out. It's a translation of a really, really long word. Um, I think I'll just break up the word for you since we don't have our Greek in resident Greek scholar here. Um, do you want this? I'll give it to you. Our budding scholars. 
in our midst. And this is one of those $50,000 words. It is un ex e ni a Ain't that a beauty? <laughs> uh, it breaks down this way. This beginning is not, it's the, it's the negative. Anytime you put an ah in front of, he's a moral man. He's a ah, moral, totally different, right? It changes it to the not. Um, and then the X, um, which <coughs> also can be ek, this happens to be X, is the origin. Not from the origin of ichnos, it would look like this. Ichnos is the um, original word. And ichnos is a track. You walk through the snow and you leave tracks, right? Ichnos is what the Greeks would say. You're leaving those. Which means not the origin of the tracks is simply incapable of being tracked by footprints or that which cannot be tracked out. And that's that, that last um, phrase there in, in verse 33. And his ways cannot be followed by tracks. You can't track him out on this. The word could be used of a bloodhound who found it impossible to follow the scent of a criminal, or of a guide who um, couldn't trace out or follow the po poorly marked path in the woods. I'm sure that's never, ever happened to you. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, which is only another, the only other occasion that this gigantic word is used. Um, yeah, slip over there, would you? To, it's just a couple of pages old. To Exodus, uh, to uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter three and verse eight. This very same word is used, and this is the only other time in the Bible. Uh, the text before us, and then chapter three of Ephesians, verse eight. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, says Paul, is this grace given that I, Paul, should preach among the Gentiles. The un, here's the word, unsearchable, untrackable riches of Christ. Christ's spiritual riches for you. You can't completely find where that, where that goes. Um, it's that remarkable. And he's, um, yeah, good enough. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then he goes on and says, um, and his ways, his ways. Um, So much fun stuff in so little time. Um, that word ways is hodos. If I take it in the singular, it's hodoi, uh, hodoi for ways in the text. But hodos is a road. It's the common Greek word for war, road. Odo and odometer reads what? It reads as the distance of the way, the road, the path, odometer. Uh, we just steal words from the Greeks that are right. Verse 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor, who hath first given to him and that he should be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are the things of which be glory forever and ever. Actually, he's just quoting from the scriptures, all right? He's quoting from Isaiah 40, uh, 40 and verse 13. 
Isaiah 40 and verse 13, a, a weak quote, uh, not very accurate, but accurate enough that they knew exactly what he was quoting there, shows that God and the sole designer of his wise plan, no one knows God's mind or gives him any advice. This is followed by a free quotation of the word of uh, Job, chapter 41, verse 11, which testifies that God's solely responsible for his acts. You don't lead him. You say, wait a minute. I pray and he does it. Yeah. He leads you to pray about a certain situation and then he answers it. Understand, you don't turn the nose. You don't turn the direction of God, Jehovah. Uh, he is sovereign in all things. The Lord is under no obligation to repay anybody. And no one has ever given him anything. And then he says of him, and through him, and to him, all things. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul concludes by reminding us that God is the first clause. He's the cause. He's the effective cause. He's the final cause of everything in our life. The deep ways beyond man's discovering, verse 33. Beyond man's knowledge, verse 34, the first part. Beyond man's counseling, verse 34, the end part. Behold, beyond man's giving, verse 35. All things come from him, and by means of him, are all for him in his glory. Therefore, to him be the glory forever. God's the only proper one to magnify. All the sovereign God deserves the praise of all his creating. Close with this. Charles Erdman, talking about this text, says, this is the expression of a faith which trusts where it can't understand, which loves where it can't explain, which reasons wisely that nothing but good can ultimately come from God. And those who accept the grace he has revealed in the gift of his Son, our Savior, and our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this time you've afforded to us. Thank you for this text. Touch our hearts as we go from this place. Let us sense the power and the presence of the Almighty, you present with us, guiding each step of the way. For it's in Christ's name.